uh, the College of Business, UCD, Management Information Systems. So, um, you know, that, that pretty much tells you uh, everything you need to know, I think. Um, except, uh, I guess, my subject area would be um, cryptocurrencies in particular. So not blockchain or enterprise blockchain, but actual, uh, say, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, and so on. And generally speaking, my um, way of approaching all this is not through, say, uh, financial markets or uh, you know, the technical underpinnings of cryptocurrencies. I'm very much focused or a believer in the, if you want to understand cryptocurrencies, you have to look at the culture. So that's one part of what I do. The other part is that I think that the practice of using cryptocurrencies is also very important and giving people, uh, I guess, like a realist appreciation of what it's actually like to use cryptocurrencies and what the purpose of uh, going through um, cryptocurrencies as opposed to traditional finance, like what is the, the reasoning behind all that? So what I'm going to do is um, just because I know some people don't have much sense of what a cryptocurrency is. So I'm going to give the world's shortest introduction to Bitcoin of about a minute. Um, and as anyone who later has taken my class or tried to understand cryptocurrencies before, you'll know that this is like a really, really reduced version of really what's going on. Right? It's a very complicated thing. It takes many weeks to understand. Um, but I don't want to focus on pure theory or just pure ideas. I want to get into the, the use case as quick as possible. So um, with that being said, uh, so the main um, purpose of why Bitcoin exists is to be a permissionless type of money. So the idea of permissionlessness uh, is the, at the center of the whole cryptocurrency culture. And the idea here is that um, the people who created Bitcoin or the people who were like the early users of Bitcoin, what they were trying to do was effectively create a way where you could transact on the internet in a similar way you might transact with people in the real world using cash, right? Directly or peer to peer. So without going through some kind of intermediary. So without having to use the infrastructure of something like PayPal or Revolu or a bank, right? So we could just directly transfer money to each other in a way where we don't require permission. So permissionless um, money, right? So that's like the basic core idea of all this, that we don't need intermediaries to help us make tra financial transactions or to do things in the financial space that we can do it ourselves, right? We, can, we don't need these people. And the payoff for this kind of thing is that we get some anonymity because we're not using, you know, we don't have to sign up to a service and give up all our documents and our, like, you know, literally giving over our names and addresses and so on. And that we don't need to do this. We don't need to give our data over to financial institutions Our financial activities should be our private business and so on. So that's the, the core idea of what Bitcoin is trying to do. It's supposed to be a type of money that uh, doesn't require the permission of a central authority in the sense of a bank or uh, even the government in the more extreme versions. So the way that this is accomplished is basically by having Bitcoin as a open source um, or a, uh, it's a, a software project. So really all Bitcoin is, is a piece of software that people download and run and then agree to the protocol, the Bitcoin protocol rules uh, for the sending and receiving of Bitcoins. That's basically all that Bitcoin is when you get into the uh, absolute fundamentals of it, right? That's all it's designed and to do to facilitate the sending and receiving of money. So to do this, you would, in the original Bitcoin kind of system, you would download the software, which is maintained by volunteer developers, and then you would be given an identity. So you're given this public private key identity. So a public address that you can receive Bitcoins to, and then a private key, which allows you to send Bitcoins associated with that public address, or really actually a whole bunch of them, but I'm not gonna get into the, uh, the details. So you have this um, identity in the, in, the, in the Bitcoin system, which isn't attached to your real world identity, right? So it's not Paul Ennis's Bitcoins, it's this alphanumeric string of numbers and letters. So that's where the anonymity of the early Bitcoin system comes in. And then when I send Bitcoins to other people, there's a special class, and this is a super, super simplification of the blockchain. Uh, there's a special class of people called miners who are looking out to see that when I send a, send a transaction that I haven't spent that transaction before. So they create this nice little uh, transaction list. They compare it with the previous one 10 minutes ago. So every 10 minutes, we update the records of who owns the Bitcoins. Um, and then 
They also engage in a puzzle race. So they race to find like a, the solution to a puzzle. The first person to find the solution gets to publish the next page in the ledger, right? So that's as short as I can give uh, a basic introduction to Bitcoin uh, without getting kind of caught up in the details. So um, in practice, so, so to get more to the idea of actually using cryptocurrencies, if I want to permissionlessly send money as a pure Bitcoin user, so as opposed to say um, the services that are gonna be built around Bitcoin, which I'll talk about in a second, what I would do, and this is the idea of not having to, you know, give up my identity, um, signing up for a service, like all that kind of stuff that we associate with um, the internet today, right? So to do things today, you basically sign up for anything, right? You have to give up all this information. So you need permission to be able to do things, right? Because that's what they're checking. They're checking your identity, either because they are worried about what you might do, or they might be just collecting your data, right? So that's another problem uh, with that kind of practice. So in Bitcoin, what we can do is we can download the software. In this case, I'm going to like use a simplified version, which is a web, uh, you know, web wallet. So that's basically where they're downloading the wallet on your behalf, more or less. So if I open up an account uh, in the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, it's a very, very straightforward proposition, right? I simply open this. I don't give any information to anybody, right? So nobody has taken my details. And I can create wallets more or less at will, right? Like I could create a wallet now, never use it. Five minutes later, open another wallet. And each of these is an identity Bitcoin system that allows me to permissionlessly send and receive money to other users in the Bitcoin network, right? And nobody can interfere or reverse any of the transactions we make, right? So there's obviously a lot of potential there. So if we create a new wallet, really all that's going to happen is it's going to first generate a private key for us, right? So it's going to generate a ownership key, which basically says whoever possesses this key owns any Bitcoins that are associated with the public thing part, which we are going to have a look at uh, in a second. So essentially, it's the password, like the, the, the analog uh, would be a password of some sort. But actually, in reality, it's, uh, it looks like this, which is basically uh, 12 words. And these 12 words can be inputted into any Bitcoin wallet. So I could like, you know, uh, have this here, then download an entirely different Bitcoin uh, wallet, like a different service that somebody has created, put that uh, 12 words in, and it will generate those Bitcoins back in, right? So again, this idea of permissionlessly. Uh, so this is your uh, ownership of Bitcoin. So as the phrase, as the crypto people say, uh, be your own bank, right? So you are in complete control of your money. Your money isn't in an account somewhere that PayPal owns. If you lose this private key, you lose your Bitcoins, right? So it's a very, uh, you know, uh, responsible thing that you have to kind of get your head around. The idea that you and only you are in control of your own money in this system. So that's why they're kind of giving out and warning and saying, you know, make sure that you've written it down uh, kind of thing. Okay, so um, this is a little bit of an awkward part. So that would be our, our private key, right? So normally what people would do is you would first kind of write it down or store it somewhere. And they're just checking that I have it, have it written down. So number 11, setup and snake is what they're looking for. So they're just checking that I've actually taken down my key. This is their own service. So I'm gonna skip uh, past this. Okay, so this is your Bitcoin wallet. This is essentially what it would look like. So very simple, very straightforward. The Bitcoin network is designed to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to send and receive Bitcoins. It doesn't do anything else. It has no bells and whistles, no fancy features like what we're gonna see in a second with Ethereum. It just does this one job really, really well. So in a web wallet like this, most Bitcoin wallets are very much like this. We're gonna have the public facing part as well, right? So we have my private key, those 12 words that I've stored. And I'm basically saying, right, uh, like they're not gonna leave my, wherever I decide to store them. And then you've got these public addresses that you can send to people and you can receive Bitcoins to this address, right? So if I just send this to you, this is my uh, address as far as the network knows. That's the only identity I have in the pure Bitcoin permissionless peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network. So if I wanted to send somebody, of course, in this case, I'm sending it to myself, right? Um, yeah, I just send them this, this wallet. So let's just imagine I'm sending it to someone else. And then I'll send them one Bitcoin. I'm super generous, right? At the moment, that's 47,000 US dollars, which is kind of crazy in and of itself. 
Uh, and then I just would add a, a fee, a transaction fee. If I want to like pay a higher fee, that will get me into the next block. So the next page that, like that's being created in the ledger, I can pay my way uh, to go through. But that's it, right? That's all that Bitcoin is doing at heart. It's a software project for the sending and receiving of money and kind of nothing else. But it's genius in its simplicity. And that's sort of the, um, the elegant nature of it. That's how most people would describe the design of Bitcoin. It's sort of like elegantly simple and it works really well at this very simple um, approach. Now, one of the consequences of using Bitcoin, which I think most of you will immediately kind of uh, be aware of or, or have heard like in the past, is that when you send and receive money in the Bitcoin network, everything is transparent. Everything is open in as much as your addresses, right? So if I send money to you, like one Bitcoin to that address, be, the, because our ledger, because of our, our blockchain is being maintained by volunteers, right? So groups of people called miners who are uh, building blocks, building the next page of the ledger, like by necessity, they need to have a copy of the ledger. So everybody needs to have a, a public copy of the ledger so we can all see what's going on transparently so that nobody's up to no good, right? So we need to be able to see everything. And we also don't have a central authority like PayPal or Revolut or your bank, which can like, you know, intervene and do anything, right? So we're kind of like watching each other um, as, a, uh, as a community, right? This is a community cultural uh, kind of thing. But it does mean that every transaction in the Bitcoin network is public or transparent. Now, of course, that means that when we say everything is transparent, we mean that your identity, that alphanumeric uh, string of numbers and letters is public. So you can see, you know, money going from uh, address to address, but you can't see anybody's actual identity, right? You know how much is being moved, but you don't know who is doing it except if somebody then decides to cash out into euros or dollars, in which case they can, right? So that's one of the uh, implications of the, the Bitcoin system. Now, to get around this, what most people do is they will use a centralized service, right? They'll use a, a, a Bitcoin exchange or a cryptocurrency exchange. They're still often called Bitcoin exchanges, even though they mostly sell like other cryptocurrencies. It's just that it's a like a a legacy name, we still call them Bitcoin exchanges uh, for the most part. So if you don't wanna, if you don't feel that you can kind of be a pure Bitcoin user who just kind of opens an account, you know, keeps their identity away from uh, any kind of services, like a real purist, you can of course sign up for like a centralized exchange and just buy Bitcoins directly to a, a centralized service. So these are those places that exist for people who just like wanna buy Bitcoin, for the purposes of speculation. So you can just straightforwardly do this to your, you know, with a, a credit card and so on, or you can go trading, right? Uh, you can go trading Bitcoin for uh, other alternative cryptocurrencies. The obvious problem for this in terms of the pure original vision of Bitcoin is that by signing up to a service like this, you give your identity away. So your real world identity, which you need to give to an exchange because of like AML laws and so on, means that you're not anonymous, right? And that would have big implications depending on what kind of activities uh, you're up to. If you're just speculating, it's not really a problem, but you know, uh, maybe for taxation, it gets very complicated uh, as you might imagine. So this is just like a classic Bitcoin exchange. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is just, uh, um, uh, let's see, this is my, uh, uh, yeah. So this is the, um, uh, an exchange called FTX, which uh, I think is worth mentioning. I didn't want to talk about it. I dropped it in very late. But a lot of the Bitcoin speculation that you see on the markets, like the real volatility, the fact that it's going up and down so much, is related to the fact that much of the trading is options, it's uh, futures. So people are using leverage to take out very large positions that they don't actually have. And then, you know, putting up small amounts of collateral, which gives them leverage. So there's a huge culture of uh, options trading, futures trading, that tends to cause a lot of the volatility that you might see in the cryptocurrency market. So I thought that was worth mentioning. Um, so uh, the one thing, uh, yeah, just to drop this in here again, this would be to, I want to just explain the, the market cap of cryptocurrency because that is relation, related to the exchanges. Um, so how is it that, uh, you know, you often hear, like at some point, if you start getting into cryptocurrency, you'll hear people talk about the total market cap of, you know, Bitcoin uh, or the market cap of Ethereum. And I just wanted to explain how that, that price gets uh, generated. 
So um, the reason why we have say Bitcoin ranked as the top market cap cryptocurrencies and then like other cryptocurrencies afterwards is because we take the, 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 uh, the current price across all the centralized exchanges. So at the moment that's 47,000 US dollars for Bitcoin. And then we multiply it by the circulating amount of uh, Bitcoins that exist in the uh, economy at the moment. And that's how we arrive at the market cap of Bitcoin, right? So just to give you, I just wanted to do that as a brief uh, explanation because I think over the coming weeks, you're gonna hear more and more talk of market caps. And so I think it would be just important that you know that that's how it's generated, the uh, price plus the circulating supply. Okay, so um, now I know I'm throwing a lot, of you, a lot at you guys, but the reason I wanna throw a lot at you is because this is sort of the normal experience of cryptocurrencies. It's, a hundred million different things going on every day and a lot of different areas developing at the same time. So we're kind of right in the middle of the innovation cycle. So there is no kind of breeding room. There's no relaxing part of cryptocurrency. It's all constant new terms, constant new technologies. So I figured I would give you the, the full uh, effect of that. So moving from Bitcoin to Ethereum, which is actually where most of the action is these days. So the news is very obsessed with Bitcoin at the moment because of uh, Elon Musk, of course, and Tesla. Um, today, the news is MasterCard is going to have crypto payments. Um, and then, uh, yeah, various different, you know, classic banks are, are getting in on the, the action as well and so on and so on. So there's a real mainstream moment for Bitcoin. But in the cryptocurrency space, most of the things that really happen actually happen on Ethereum, which is the main competitor to Bitcoin. And the reason why more things happen on Ethereum is because it's made to be different. It's made to be much more malleable or much more flexible. And from my perspective, it's actually what's most interesting. I spend most of my time in the Ethereum world these days. Whereas when I was younger, say from 2010 to 2015, 16, 17, it was kind of all Bitcoin. And then I switched over to Ethereum at some point. So in Ethereum, we do have transactions. So you can still permissionlessly send and receive a native currency and that currency is called um, ether right so it has its own currency in the same way we have bitcoin uh, bitcoins we have ether so we can send and receive ether uh, to each other in a permissionless way so we could use it in the same way we use bitcoin but there's also something else that's going to be included in our blocks and that's going to get updated so we're going to be updating not just transactions every every so often in bitcoin is 10 minutes in ethereum it's going to be 10 to 20 seconds um, so we have transactions, but we also have these uh, small applications, and I'm using that term very loosely, small applications or uh, little pieces of code that have like a simple business logic or a simple organizational logic, or a like maybe a game, I'll, I'll talk about examples of this in a second, but basically simple um, code that can be executed in the block, right? So instead of it being a record keeping system like Bitcoin, it's a, it's a ledger of transactions. In Ethereum, it's a ledger of transactions plus a computer that executes these small programs. So now we're doing something very different. Now we're having a world computer and that's what Ethereum is, right? We're gonna be uh, updating a ledger every uh, 10 to 20 seconds. So if you're in a, a developer in Ethereum, what you can do is you can basically come up with uh, mini applications called smart contracts. And this is something that would take me much, much longer to explain, but uh, I, let, I think app, small applications is a fairly good approximation. Uh, and that's kind of like, okay, for you to understand for the moment. Um, so uh, in, the, in the language called Solidity that works on Ethereum, what I can do is I can come up with um, a, let's say I wanted to do a voting system. And I want my voting system to live on the Ethereum blockchain, right? So I'm going to uh, create a smart contract and I'm going to write it up and I'm going to say, right, this is like a, yeah, it's exactly what you'd expect, right? Basically, uh, you know, vote for this person, vote for that person, end date of the, uh, the vote. And that's all that's written in the smart contract. And then I deploy it to the Ethereum blockchain, right? I send it to the Ethereum blockchain to live where it's going to be available on the Ethereum world computer permissionlessly, right? It lives there forever on the Ethereum blockchain. And there's nobody who can like stop me from using it, right? So I, as long as I'm an Ethereum user, I can just write a smart contract, write a little ballot system like here, send it to the Ethereum blockchain, and then that's it, right? That, that, that's just uh, what happens. So um, how do people interact with it? Well, they trigger the smart contract 
by sending Ether, the native currency, to make things happen, right? So if I have a voting system, I can basically make it so that um, when you send Ether to the smart contract address, it will trigger a vote. So people are voting with their Ether, the currency, to, to vote either way. And then at a certain point, right, we, we say the, the, the vote is finished. So in Ethereum, we have this kind of more flexible idea of a computer. Um, okay, so that's one thing you can do. Uh, another thing that you can do, which is quite interesting in Ethereum, is that you can permissionlessly raise capital, right? So you can raise money in Ethereum in a very unique and interesting way. So you can create a smart contract, but in this smart contract, all we do is uh, we create our own token, right? So I just write this smart contract, I send it to the Ethereum blockchain, and then it, it generates like tokens, right? So when you send Ether to it, you're gonna get a certain amount of my tokens from my project, say Paul token or something uh, in return. So the contract is basically just swapping ether that I want to raise to fund my project and you're getting a token which is gonna be usable in some kind of context as a reward back. So that's the self-funding mechanism, the self-raising of capital in the cryptocurrency space. And that's known as an initial coin offering on ICOs. You might've heard from 2017 uh, kind of era. And what's useful about this is it means that the cryptocurrency space isn't reliant on traditional venture capital funding for its money. If you want to start a, a, a project, you usually just wait a while, you create a token, that's what funds the project, right? And that, I mean, that's where the cryptocurrency space, it doesn't have to be as formal as other spaces because it can raise its own money, right? It's not beholden to the traditional financial system. And that's why it's got that sort of reputation as a, a bit more wild west. So. If I create a token to an initial coin offering sale, the next thing that I might want to do is um, either you know transfer, like, okay, let's say I buy um, ICO tokens um, in a sale. And then a few months later, I want to trade the token that I bought um, you know, for another token for another project. Well, in Ethereum, there are uh, exchanges, decentralized exchanges, where you can seamlessly tra like tr trade any token for any other token on the Ethereum blockchain seamlessly, right? It's a very, very simple process. And this means that the liquidity in the Ethereum space like moves in this constant churning fashion. It's very seamless, very frictionless, except for one thing, which is the fees, which I'm not gonna talk about today. Um, okay, so for example, this website, Uniswap, it's just a smart contract, right? It, this is a front end of a simple smart contract, which says if you have like ETH and you want to you want to swap it for um, balancer or something, then that's what we do, right? The smart contract is just going to allow you to trade those tokens, and you can just keep moving between those tokens without having to go through any um, sign up process or anything. You can just interact directly with this project, which is simply a smart contract living on the Ethereum blockchain that is only programmed to do one thing, to swap tokens. And this is the Uniswap uh, protocol, as it's known. Now, in interestingly, and I want to really stress this and drive it home, the, um, the a project like Uniswap and a project, most projects in the uh, Ethereum space, they're not run as companies. They might be started by people, enthusiasts. In some cases, they might have companies, but actually they're run by the users, right? So Uniswap is run by people who own the uni token. So at some point in the past, uh, the uni project, uh, in this case, they had an airdrop. So they just like dropped um, any, they dropped the uni, the token into like a smart contracts of anybody who used it in the past, but more traditionally it would be like a token sale. So if you own this token, it means you have a stake or a say in the governance of Uniswap itself. And this is what's known as a decentralized autonomous organization. And I know I'm sounding super, science fictiony at this point, but this is like real stuff that's going on now. That's a DAO. So most cryptocurrency projects are run as decentralized autonomous organizations, where if you own a token associated with that project, you are part of the governance structure. So you get to vote on ch changes to the project. So you might vote for like the grant system or, you know, some other kind of thing. And um, so you would send uh, like you would have uni tokens, which would give you the capacity to vote for or against different propositions. So the entire project is run on the Ethereum blockchain as a decentralized autonomous organization. Users with a token voting for proposals and then them being implemented by the uh, development team, you know, the people who are, are behind it. 
So again, just it's another idea, of, another example of this real um, disruptive nature of what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to end on this because I know that's that's like a lot of different things, and you're probably thinking like DAOs, uh, you know, uh, smart contracts, uh, all these different terms. They they come thick and fast. Um, but this is probably one of the, the more fun uh, kind of examples, but nonetheless, um, its own important eco sub ecosystem, sub economy in the wider Ethereum e ecosystem, which is the idea of non fungible tokens or blockchain art. So blockchain art depends on a very simple type of smart contract. So in this smart contract, instead of creating tokens like with an ICO. In ICO, we, take, we, we create fungible tokens, right? Tokens that can be seamlessly exchanged on Uniswap or something, right? So nice liquidity uh, movement that, go, that goes around there. But you can also create smart contracts which basically are singular, right? Non-fungible. They just re they exist only as their own thing. So that means you can create games around that where your, your uh, token is extremely rare, right? Or you can make it like kind of common or kind of rare or super rare or whatever. You can see how you could then build a game around this. So the most common example of an NFT blockchain game or the most popular ever game, sorry, is known as CryptoKitties. So this is just to give you an example of a business that's built on the Ethereum blockchain based around smart contracts. So in this game, what we have are CryptoKitties which belong to it. Like, so the whole game CryptoKitties is a smart contract. And what it does is it generates Sub smart, sub, sub smart contracts, um, each of which is a crypto kitty, right? So each crypto kitty is a simple smart contract. And what it does is it contains a bunch of attributes, right? As they call them. And um, so for example, and this is no small money, right? Like an, a, a really good crypto kitty is 35,000 US dollars, right? The most expensive crypto kitty is something like 150,000 US dollars. So when I say this game is it's a game, but it's you know it's serious uh, money um, behind it. And if you check out websites like OpenSea or Rarables, you'll see art today, blockchain art going for like hundreds of thousands of US dollars. So for example, this is just a, a smart contract um, where the attributes right are just built in, um, and then people are basically trying to you know own crypto kitties that have these uh, attributes or these uh, attributes. And then of course what we can do right is we can make the uh, one smart contract interact with another smart contract so we can breed the crypto kitties and then we can create a, like a sub smart contract which is a new crypto kitty uh, and so on and so on which will inherit a mixture of the traits and you can build a game then around this like smart contract um, kind of logic okay so um, and then i just wanted to stress one last thing which is like from the user's perspective it's a simple thing of I start a wallet, like I create a, a, an Ethereum wallet, which generates a private key, right? And then it has like a public facing address. And in this case, the, the wallet's very simple. It's MetaMask that will allow you to interact with anything in the Ethereum uh, online space. You can just, uh, like if you want to do anything, you just get a MetaMask wallet. You can interact with this whole Ethereum ecosystem pretty seamlessly. So here we're just signing in. Um, so if I wanted to play Crypto Kitties, if I wanted to buy a cat, buy with each, that's how I do it. And I actually did buy one um, earlier on. So we have uh, Jenny of Data Stock. You've got your own Crypto Kitty. Uh, number one, as you can see. So I picked one. It's not super expensive. And so this can be the uh, Data Stock uh, Crypto Kitty. Um, you guys can check maybe in a year or two to see whether it's of more value. Um, this we can change, unfortunately, so we can change the description, but you know that's that's not a here nor there. But the CryptoKitty was uh, created in 2008, which means it could be valuable in a little while. Little while. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Um, I think that's probably like a, a decent fun note to, to kind of end on. And then there's probably like a lot of questions because I brought up, I did the whole like shotgun approach of like every interesting thing I could think of. Thank you, Paul. I'm flattered. <laughs> um, guys, does anyone have any questions? That was absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you so much for giving such a holistic overview. I think that, well, I thoroughly enjoyed it any, anyway. So feel free to, to ask away in the chat or just unmute yourself, whatever, whatever you prefer. Hey, Paul, thanks so much for that. I have a quick question for you. So, um, yeah, I think... Uh, 
you mentioned earlier that one of the things about uh, about Ethereum and blockchain is the privacy um, that you know you're hiding behind the kind of uh, alphanumeric key. But uh, I guess like it's kind of strange that when you share your key with somebody, right? They they can they only have to pop it into Etherscan and they can see all the transactions you've ever made and kind of how much money is in your bank account in a way. Like so, I, I, how do you? Is there like a workaround for that? Like how do how do you get around that kind of privacy issue? Yeah, that, that is a huge problem. And I think it's a huge problem with Ethereum in particular, because um, in Ethereum, there's way more activity. You're, you're using um, Ethereum in a much more, uh, like in Bitcoin, you may not move your Bitcoins like much. You might, you, you might move your Bitcoins like once a year, or if you're a darknet market user, maybe you use it a bit more, more, more than that. But generally speaking, most people aren't really moving their Bitcoins. And so there's a very little possibility, except that they're cashing it out into euros or whatever, uh, that people will figure out their identity. Um, but in the, the Ethereum ecosystem, you're constantly moving in and out of different opportunities, whether that's buying blockchain art, whether it's using decentralized exchanges, or you're trading, like speculating on different, uh, you know, decentralized finance uh, coins, which is the, the popular thing at the moment. So DeFi, is something I didn't really talk about too much, but that's where most of the uh, action is. So if we looked at the um, uh, coin market cap, you'll see that DeFi has its own section. Uh, so this would be, you know, people just trading uh, those different tokens. So um, the the generally speaking, I would say that you don't have much. Like if somebody does find your account, like there's really nothing you can do. Like they're you're, they're just going to be able. If someone has like a simple snapshot of your uh, Ethereum account, they know that's you, like they have a full complete record and history of everything you've ever done. So if you are conscious of that kind of thing, the, the, the most common suggestion from the cryptocurrency community is that you should be changing wallets or you should have like, you know, um, compartmentalized wallets. So you should have a wallet, which has like your, your serious funds. Like, you know, let's say you're, you're, you've got like five Ethereum here or something like this, and then you have a separate address that you uh, use for like all the different messy stuff that you might be involved with. And that's also the solution that Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin um, suggested. He said that people should reuse addresses uh, constantly. So that's what they suggest. But in reality, I found this personally, like that's just not really what happens, right? So you just kind of become lazy and you just sort of end up not doing that. And that's sort of generally what I know. If you're a hardcore user, you can use Bitcoin mixing services. You can also use a service called uh, Tornado Cash, which just came out um, recently. So this is a uh, privacy service that's uh, extremely popular at the moment. This was funded by Gitcoin, which is like the official, well, semi-official Ethereum funding system. So you can use this to mix your uh, Ethereum transactions with other users. So if you're paranoid, you want to hide your identity, then you will need to use a mixing service, which will uh, throw your uh, account and your transactions in with other people. And it doesn't guarantee that people can't figure out your identity. It just makes it so that it's hard to figure out who exactly did what. So that, that's the, the best solution we have. It's uh, yeah, one of the problems of the, 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 the public ledger, unfortunately. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a question here in the chat from, uh, from Drac. He asked, um, you mentioned Tesla and MasterCard are introducing crypto payments. And he said, uh, to what extent do you see crypto going? What are its limits and will it become the main way of exchanging money? Um, yeah, I mean, this is the uh, um, a difficult question for me because uh, uh, on one hand, I think a lot of people uh, they get drawn into cryptocurrency because the, of the price. You know, they get drawn into the, the money, the, the speculation, the excitement every time that there's a, um, every time there's a, a rally. So last time was 2017, 2018. That's when Bitcoin first got into the mainstream consciousness. And then recently with the, you know, Elon Musk type situation, even the Dogecoin, the Wall Street bets, financial activism, like all that, that kind of uh, element. Um, so I'm reluctant to tell those people that Bitcoin is going to be, um, is guaranteed to succeed because the enemies that Bitcoin has are probably the most powerful enemies that, that could exist, right? Like you're talking about 
a currency that essentially its, it's long-term goal for the real Bitcoin hardcore user is not just to be a supplement to the economic system, but to completely replace it, right? So the, to the true believer of cryptocurrency, um, that kind of goal is going to take a very, very long time, of course, right? So that's like a 50-year, 100-year project. That's the, the, the meme that you'll hear from Bitcoin, which is uh, one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, right? So like that's the only thing they're interested in. It's not interested in kind of being co-opted. And what I think will, will happen, I, I, I do believe that, I do believe eventually in the, the very long-term view, uh, Bitcoin like, has a very strong possibility of succeeding, but I doubt we'll be around to see it. What I think we will be around to see is a uh, mainstreaming. Uh, a, a few years ago, I wrote an article called The Gentrification uh, of Bitcoin kind of is coming. I think there will be, um, yeah, there will be strong institutional support for Bitcoin and I think it will be seen as something that you will necessarily have to have if you're like running a fund um, or if you're um, like this, run, like even if you're just like a pension manager, you know, you, like your clients are going to want you to have like a certain degree of exposure to cryptocurrency. But I don't believe anytime soon that Bitcoin will be the, you know, a, a commonly used currency. I think it's something people are going to have a little bit of their, their money in, but everybody's in a wait and see uh, kind of situation. I, I think it's also clear that most people don't really understand the goals of cryptocurrency as um, as, as a kind of uh, challenge to the economic system. That, much of that gets lost. They, they think it's just supposed to be um, like just another currency, whereas uh, the real aim is to be like a dead currency. I think that's sort of missed in the much of the media. We have a question from uh, Zaur there as well. He has his hand up. Hey, how are you doing, Paul? Uh, thanks for the talk. I uh, really enjoyed listening to that. Um, I guess uh, I guess I wanted to ask um, a more e economics question, just from from a, having an economics background. Uh, uh, what's your take on sort of? Um, I read a good article there. I think it was on CoinDesk uh, regarding um, Bitcoin and inflation, and sort of essentially the relationship between inflation and and. The more we print, perhaps it it, 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 it it does better for, I mean, I think it was something, uh, it was the Federal Reserve that said that there, there might be higher inflation in 21, um, they kind of, a, a bit of a post-pandemic, they, they're kind of welcoming it. I guess, does that does that strengthen Bitcoin and crypto? Or, I mean, what kind of that interesting relationship is, do you, uh, what's your kind of take on that? Yeah, I mean, this is the, this is the, the, the crazy but sorry, the, the, the interesting thing, which is also a little bit crazy about cryptocurrency, and I think this is something if you're an economic student, like is really, really like an interesting uh, area that you can kind of research and study, even if it's just like as a hobby or something, but it's an attempt to, you know, like if the first real experiment in terms of like, a, a, like a, an actual uh, currency that like wants to be used by people that has this very strongly built in deflationary like aspect, like it's an aspiration of the Bitcoin system is to be a, a deflationary um, digital gold. And that's why we have our, you know, a 21 million uh, Bitcoin scarcity um, limit. So uh, I don't know how that's going to play out. And I think there's also an important thing that um, uh, people overlook. And this is a common misconception, which is around the idea of um, so at the moment we have like 18 million Bitcoins or 18 and a half million Bitcoins mined or something like that. It might even be more. Yeah, sorry, I better check that. Um, and um, yeah, 18 and a half. So, okay, my numbers are good. Um, so 18 and a half million Bitcoins mined. And then eventually it's going to be like 21 million. And you can uh, also tell that uh, for a lot of people, they think the last few million of Bitcoins are going to be gone in the next few years, right? That's a common assumption. That's not actually true. The last Bitcoins we mined in 2140, right? So that's when the last Bitcoins are mined because the last million or so are going to be really, really difficult to win. The block reward, like the reward that you can get from mining blocks gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's kind of very uh, interesting thing. So we're not really going to see the deflationary test of Bitcoin until then. So we're not, we have like a hundred years until the, 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 tr the experiment really begins. But I do think it's interesting that a lot of people nonetheless believe that they need to accumulate and get the last Bitcoins. And I think that's what's happening now. So to me, that seems to be some kind of proof that people do have some faith in this narrative of a digital gold scarcity deflationary currency 
So there is a, an appetite for that. And I think it's a good, um, it's a strong explanation for why the institutional money would be drawn into it. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know if it will work as like an actual exper uh, experiment. I, I, one thing I, I would mention is that um, the, uh, so Bitcoin has this deflationary aspect to it. So it has this digital gold thing, but I think it's important to point out that not every cryptocurrency has this. So if you want to examine different cryptocurrencies, you're basically examining a bunch of different experiments in, in uh, economics. So Ethereum doesn't have a cap, right? It doesn't have a, a limit on the amount of Ethereum uh, that are produced. Um, coins like Cardano, which are extremely popular at the moment, have like billions and billions uh, of coins. XRP is 100 billion. Um, and then, for example, Dogecoin, which a lot of people will have heard of this week, it was created as a critique of the um, pretensions of Bitcoin's uh, deflationary ambitions because it said that the, like the original joke uh, behind Dogecoin was that Bitcoin is scarce and valuable so people won't spend it, which seems to defeat the whole point of a you know, digital cash or you know, a cryptocurrency. So that's why Dogecoin uh, has like 100 billion Dogecoins and every block produces like 15 million new Dogecoins. So there's like an inflationary thing. And then the idea is that people would spend Dogecoin and that's what they did in the beginning. They used to give lots of money to charity. So I don't know what the, um, like what the, I don't have a good answer for the, like the actual like economics of it, but I do, yeah, at least hopefully can point out that there are competing uh, economic theories embedded in each cryptocurrency uh, for you to explore, I guess. Emish just has a question there in the chat as well. Hi, Paul. I'm wondering, do these crypto developers or communities hold any accountability to the users of the currency to maintain the value and the security of the crypto balances, the way banks and governments on paper anyway have the respons responsibility to its citizens and users? Uh, no, is the answer. Um, so um, to maintain the price, absolutely not. That, that, that no, no cryptocurrency guarantees that. In fact, if you want to point out, if you want to determine if a cryptocurrency is a scam, so something, you know, like uh, I often get forwarded, forwarded these um, like WhatsApp messages from people who, are, who kind of know that I'm a lecturer in cryptocurrency and they want to ask me about like, is this a good opportunity, right? This is like the bane of my existence, people sending me a dodgy cryptocurrency projects. And they'll always promise, right? Like a Ponzi scheme promises some kind of, like it's gonna go up or, you know, this kind of thing. So the developers of a cryptocurrency project are typically believers ideologically. So they have like a political commitment to, you know, the project. So the people who develop Bitcoin are usually cypherpunks. So they believe in open source digital activism. The people who are behind Ethereum are very community oriented. They, they wanna build, uh, fair organizations. So that's sort of the, the Ethereum uh, vibe. Um, and then let's say, uh, for example, um, yeah, let's, let's, like sticking with the, the Dogecoin group right there, they're kind of like a joke uh, uh, currency uh, and so on and so on. But it, nowhere in any developer community would there be an obligation or expectation that the, um, yeah, that the value can be, would have to be maintained. And when Dogecoin was going up recently, uh, a lot of the people who are new to Dogecoin who, who went to the subreddit and start asking about, would it be possible to put a cap on Dogecoin, right? Because that would make it more scarce because they discovered that Dogecoin is like a hundred billion, right? So that means that uh, unlike Bitcoin, there isn't this sort of like scarcity deflationary narrative, which helps drive up the price, like at least in theory. And when they discovered that they tried to pressure the Dogecoin developers who explicitly told them that that's not what that's not in the spirit of what Dogecoin was set out to do. Now you could, of course, have a situation where like a big enough community pushed out the original developers, but you know, generally speaking, it's easier to just kind of like start your own uh, new project. And that's basically why we have so many cryptocurrencies, right? There's eight thousand four hundred at the moment. That's basically just people with their own uh, original view. Now there is a strong expectation when a project launches that you you're going to see like uh, you know if you're early enough in a community uh, if you're early enough in a project so when DeFi was going on early in September that's what I spent most of my summer doing summer in August was joining DeFi projects because I knew by participating in those communities 
uh, I would know when the ICO sale started. So I would accumulate the, those coins at that time. And then now when the, you know, the, everything is going up, all those coins have also done particularly well. So the best thing you could do really like to discover value would be being early and involved in the organic community, like not trying to um, have like a guaranteed value, but like participating widely would be the, the way I would approach that. And then in terms of security, um, no. So if you get hacked or whatever, um, so if your Bitcoins are stolen, your Ethereum is stolen, or your Ether is stolen, or your ADA is stolen, that's nothing to do with the developers. Uh, that's your wallet. They're your own keys, your own private keys. So if you get robbed, uh, that's, that's on you. So your, your own bank. Um, so that, that's tough luck. And they'll say it to you, if you go on the Reddit and say, I've just been robbed, they'll say, well, you know, next time be, be better at security. So they can be quite harsh about that. It's one of my least favorite uh, parts. I think, does Megan have a question? I'm not sure if she still has her hand up. Um, I had a quick question. I think um, okay. some other guys had their, had their hands up first, but this is a, yeah, a, a very uh, short one. So I think it's really based on Paul, what you were just saying there um, around an ICO. So whenever you're raising money for a project with that, I, I know that it would go to the ledger, it would go onto the chain, right? But would a lot of the, I suppose, advertising for that then be done in other forums and through the community in other places then? If you wanted to launch something um, like Uniswap, uh, you would really have to kind of market it elsewhere. Is that, that's my understanding, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, so th there is, um, um, in the beginning, so in the old days, so you, 2010 era to 2015 or something, um, the projects weren't uh, as valuable. So they were basically just like a hobby places. So uh, if you launched, say, um, so when you when you launched Dogecoin or um, what's an old school cryptocurrency, Litecoin. So this is like, this was number two uh, cryptocurrency for many, many years. And you, you would just launch your coin on a place called Bitcoin Talk. Um, I'll show you now. And um, you would just hope that like other enthusiasts uh, would find it, right? So it's like on a message board, which is something most of you have probably like not even seen. Like this is before social media, like really, um, or not before social media, but kind of like the last legs of the pre-social media internet. So um, you would just launch your coin in this very simple way. And everything is like very rudimentary, right? So the graphics were very rudimentary and so on. Now, as cryptocurrency begins to gain value, like you start to get very, very slick, um, uh, kind of um, average, like, uh, yeah, so let's say a good example would be SushiSwap, which I often think is a good example of just a very good looking uh, kind of website. So when SushiSwap started out, uh, before it launched the ICO, so in the, the months leading up to it, there would be the, like lots of, there would be like a medium accounts, which would be started, which would introduce the project. So they would say, there's, we've got a new de decentralized finance cryptocurrency project uh, that we're starting. And then it would also build out the community. So your, your marketing efforts would be oriented toward building an organic community. So either through uh, Discord usually and Reddit. So Reddit and Discord would be your, your main ways of trying to gather people in. And then through the Discord, basically uh, running all your like giveaways and you know like kind of uh, establishing newsletters and all this kind of stuff. So they're, they're kind of like companies, but in a very informal way. So the organization before the official blockchain launch is basically yeah like um, yeah trying to establish like a like an, an early community and that's not very hard to do these days right because people want to find these projects early because if they know about the the launch of the token then um, you know like there will often be like a pre-sale as well like that's very common uh, so it's it's not too hard to pull people into like a cryptocurrency project but yeah a few months before you begin establishing your presence on the internet you start making a comment you try get into the, the media you try get in the news you try getting coin desk uh, if, if it's possible uh, and then like you're you're kind of promising people like features now you're not promising people the price will go up but you're promising them like interesting innovations uh, in the say DeFi space Very interesting. Thank you. Great. Do we have Zara? Are you asking another question? 
Yeah, just uh, one more for me. Um, yeah, again, really interesting stuff, Paul. Um, it's really nice listening to this. Um, I, I guess I just I, I wanted to just ask more, more kind of your thoughts on it rather than a question. Um, like the everyday kind of person you 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 talk to um, doesn't really, I guess you could say, trust the crypto sphere, right? Like they're, they're really hesitant if you just have like a conversation with anyone um, like that, that you bump into in the street, they really kind of, they, they almost back off and say, hmm. And you, you had kind of recently there, I think it was the newly elected um, um, uh, secretary of treasury in the, in the States uh, who kind of who kind of came out and said like, look, uh, as far as cryptos and Bitcoin co- goes, uh, we need to restrict it, curtail it. You know, it's, it's pretty much illegal financing is what, you know, so it seems like the establishment, generally speaking, the, the system isn't really in favor of cryptos. And they kind of, more than anything, are, are doing their best to make sure that it doesn't get into the, not not to say the legitimate, but the 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 kind of the establishment. And well, I mean, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Do, do you think that's going to be the biggest barrier to 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 its popularity, or or yeah? Yeah, it, it's a game of cat and mouse. Um, I, I mean, the 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 public trust is interesting because I would say when it comes to the average. Uh, retail investor and so on that I would say that they shouldn't trust cryptocurrency right because there's so much not that they shouldn't trust cryptocurrency but they should be very wary about getting into the space because there is a very so one of the like interesting paradoxes is that um, if you open up a, a space where like you're permissionlessly able to do anything right so you can just launch a project in the Ethereum blockchain now like we could just have an ICO Um, built around like some random idea that we came up with and then we can raise a bunch of money in ethereum and then we can disappear like two months from now right and that happens all the time uh during the 2017 boom icos raise hundreds of millions of dollars and then disappear at the same time you also have projects which are very very like legitimate and have like a strong place in people's uh kind of hearts and they, they they like play fair and so on so there is an element where i think um like the, that, that kind of mistrust isn't completely misplaced. I definitely get that. And um, it's hard to tell people, it's hard to get across to people to the idea that you're on your own, you know, like you yourself are responsible for all your money. And if like, there are going to be people who take advantage of that, right? Because you, you have people who expect that you're going to be able to reverse transactions, uh, that you can like recover an account or so on. Uh, but in crypto, that's not the case. So to enter the kind of crypto mind, you you basically have to reach a situation where your you like your 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 personal financial freedom trumps the risks, and that's that's very difficult to, to get around. And on the other hand, I do think governments and you know traditional finance they like the fact that there's this mistrust there because they're in the business of ensuring that something which is a direct economic uh, threat. So it, it is it is aiming to. Uh, free money from governments, like so from the influence of government. So they want to replace fiat currency. So money by government and um, completely. So, I mean, they're very correct in their assessment to be uh, opposed to it. Um, yeah, so if I, I, I see that as a perfectly logical reaction from their, from their perspective, like they should be afraid of it because it is attempting to uh, challenge them. And for many years that didn't really matter because cryptocurrency was kind of small. But now it's seeping a little bit more into the mainstream culture. And that's where it's become very problematic for them. Because if people are switched on little by little, then it is a huge threat, right? Because it's basically creating areas of the economy that are outside the influence of government regulation. Uh, so like decentralized finance, for example, if you go to the Wikipedia page, like one of the, one of the things it says is it's like non-AML compliant. Like that's one of the features of decentralized finance. It's, it's, it's direct peer-to-peer uh, you know, options, trading, derivatives, like all that stuff that can't be regulated by any government. And that, I think that is a genuine threat uh, to them. And understandably, they, they don't like it. All right. Thanks, Paul. Is there, is there any other questions? No, I think so, we, we've, can I say we've something? got a, Yeah, yeah. All right. Sorry, I was just asking, Paul, you said you wrote a paper about the gentrification of the Bitcoin. Do you have a name for that paper? Or I'd like to read it if it was available online. Um, yeah, I'll have a look. I'll see if I can just pull it. Yeah, the gentrification of ICOs is underway. So this is from 2017, which is like from a whole different um, 
kind of era. But yeah, it might be interesting for you guys to read like how different, uh, you know, things have changed um, over the years. So yeah, that's the title there. Brilliant. Um, okay, well, if that's it, everyone, um, I think we can finish up. Paul, thank you so much again for um, taking the time out of your Thursday evening to um, host this status Talk workshop. I hope that everyone enjoyed it. Um, yeah, and with that, I think I'll, I'll stop recording um, and I'll end the call now. Thanks, Thanks Paul. again, Paul.